office, in which it is proved, notwithstanding their names ending in OS and IS, the heroes of the story which we are about to have the honor to relate to our readers have nothing mythological about them. A short time ago, while making researches in the Royal Library for my history of Louis XIV, Louis XIV, I stumbled by chance upon the memoirs of Monsieur d'Artagnan, printed, as were most of the works of that period, in which authors could not tell the truth without the risk of residence more or less long in the Bastille, at Amsterdam, by Pierre Rouge. The title attracted me. I took them home with me, with the permission of the guardian, and devoured them. It is not with my intention here to enter into an analysis of this curious work, and I shall satisfy myself with referring such of my readers as appreciate the pictures of the period to its pages. They will therein find portraits penciled by the hands of a master. And although these clips may be, for the most part, traced upon the doors of barracks, the walls of cabarets, they will not find the likenesses of Louis XIII, and of Austria, Richelieu, Mazarin, and the courtiers of the period less faithful than in the history of Monsieur Anquetil. But it is well known what strikes the capricious mind of the poet is not always what affects the mass of readers. Now, while admiring as others doubtless will admire, the details we have to relate, our main preoccupation concerned a matter to which no one before ourselves had given a thought. D'Artagnan relates that, on his first visit to Monsieur de Treville, captain of the king's musketeers, he met in the antechamber three young men serving in the illustrious corps, and to which he was soliciting the honor of being received, bearing the names of Athos, Porthos and Aramis. We must confess, these three strange names struck us, and it immediately occurred to us that they were but pseudonyms under which D'Artagnan had disguised names perhaps illustrious, or else that the hearers of these borrowed names had themselves chosen them on the day in which, from caprice, discontent, or want of fortune, they had donned the simple musketeer's uniform. And from that moment, we had no rest till we could find some trace in contemporary works of these extraordinary names which had so strongly awakened our curiosity. The catalog alone of the books we read with this ob object would fill a whole chapter, which, although it might be very instructive, would certainly afford our readers but little amusement. It will suffice, then, to tell them that at the moment at which, discouraged by so many fruitless investigations, we were about to abandon our search, we at length found, guided by the counsels of our illustrious friend, Paulin Paris, a manuscript in folio, endorsed 4772 or 4773. We do not recollect which, having for title Memoirs of the Comte de la Fere, touching some events which passed in France toward the end of the reign of King Louis XIII and the commencement of the reign of King Louis XIV. It may be easily imagined how great was our joy when, in turning over this manuscript, our last hope, we found at the 20th page the name of Athos, at the 27th the name of Porthos, and at the 31st, the name of Aramis. The discovery of a completely unknown manuscript at a period in which historical science is carried to such a high degree appeared almost miraculous. We hasten, therefore, to obtain permission to print it with the view of presenting ourselves some day with a pack of others at the doors of the Academy des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres. If we should not succeed, a very probable thing, by the by, 
in gaining admission to the Academy Falsets with our own proper pack. This permission, we feel bound to say, was graciously granted, which compels us here to give a public contradiction to the slanderers who pretend that we live under a government but moderately indulgent to men of letters. This is the first part of this precious manuscript, which we offer to our readers, restoring it to the title which belongs to it, and entering into an engagement that, if of which we have no doubt, this first part should obtain the success it merits, we will publish the second immediately. In the meanwhile, as the godfather is a second father, we beg the reader to lay to our account and not to that of the Comte de la Fere, the pleasure or the ennui he may experience. This being understood, let us proceed with our history. And look at this beautiful, beautiful. is here, I believe that is D'Artagnan, being held back from fighting with this gentleman here. I've already forgotten his name. This is chapter one. On the first Monday of the month of April 1625, the market town of Myung, in which the author of Romance of the Rose was born, appeared to be in as perfect a state of revolution as if the Huguenots had just made a second La Rochelle of it. Many citizens, seeing the women flying toward the high street, leaving their children crying at the open doors, hastened to don the queers and supporting their somewhat uncertain courage with a musket or a partisan, directed their steps toward the hostelry of the Jolly Miller, before which was gathered, increasing every minute, a compact group, vociferous and full of curiosity. In those times, panics were common, and few days passed without some city or other registering in its archives an event of this kind. There were nobles who made war against each other. There was the king who made war against the cardinal. There was Spain, which made war against the king. Then, in addition to these concealed or public secret or open wars, there were robbers, mendicants, Huguenots, wolves, and scoundrels who made war upon everybody. The citizens always took up arms readily against thieves, wolves, or scoundrels, often against nobles or Huguenots, sometimes against the king, but never against the cardinal or Spain. It resulted then from this habit that on the said first Monday of April, 1625, the citizens on hearing the clamor and seeing neither the red and yellow standard, nor the livery of the Duke de Richelieu, rushed toward the hostel of the Jolly Miller. When arrived there, the cause of the hubbub was apparent to all. 
a young man. We can sketch his portrait at a dash. Imagine yourself a Don Quixote of 18. A Don Quixote without his corselet, without his coat of mail, without his 